Our next speaker is Ned David. Ned fell deeply in love with structural biology, how things that make us alive are shaped. In Chem 27, which was taught then and maybe now by the venerable George Whitesides, who strongly resembles Patrick Stewart, think Captain Jean-Luc Picard, or recently Charles Xavier from X-Men. It was Whitesides' class that made Ned decide to do what he did with the rest, what he has done with the rest of his life. Ned's talk is called Why Granny Wants You Dead, Dispatches from the Frontiers of Biotechnology. Thanks, Robbie. I actually did not expect you to include the X-Men reference, but uh, I'm glad that it went over okay. Okay, you guys are still listening. All right, so I'm a biochemist, and I've been super lucky. I've been able to found a series of biotech companies. Some have been successful. Others have totally failed. But every one of them had some incredibly cool, sublime moment that I remember and will remember forever. And some of them left me with scars. I'm going to talk about both. And I'm not just going to talk about the stuff that worked. I want to talk about the projects that really mattered, at least to me. Now, all of my work really started right over there in Science Center C when Professor Whitesides showed us this wiggling chemical bond. This is a peptide bond. This is the chemical bond in proteins that holds amino acids together and it allows proteins to bend and twist just enough that proteins can adopt these exquisite three-dimensional shapes. And it's these shapes that drive the biochemistry of life. And when I saw this, I thought it was beautiful. I wanted to spend the rest of my life working on it. Now, protein structures are a lot more than just beauty. They're also useful. This is the structure of HIV protease. This is the enzyme HIV uses to cleave its large proteins into smaller ones, and it allows the virus to be infectious and cause disease. This little green molecule is an HIV protease inhibitor. This drug was architected atom by atom based on this structure. That little green molecule and the protein that gave birth to it are the reason today that AIDS is a managed condition, as opposed to a death sentence, at least in the developed world. Now, when I went to graduate school at Berkeley, it took one person five years slaving away to solve one of these structures. And my PhD advisor and I thought this was way too slow. And we were thinking, is there some way we could take the very best of what automation did for the car industry, but mix that with modern molecular biology to solve protein structures really fast? And this became the basis of my first company, Cyrix. So we did this crazy thing for a biotech company. We recruited a bunch of car engineers from Saturn. Uh, the car company, not the planet. Um, and uh, <laughs> we built a bunch of machines that no one had ever seen before. These were room-sized machines that allowed us to do a million experiments a day compared to a few hundred experiments a week. To give you a sense of scale, this was 23 times not what one person could do, but every, st every structural biologist in the world working in that era, working together, could do. And as you can imagine, this allowed us to solve protein structures really fast. Remember how I said it took one person five years to do a structure? Well, we did this in a month, 42 structures. It was a record in structural biology. But for me, the coolest part of the Cyrix story is this. This is the structure of DPP-4. It's an enzyme involved in type 2 diabetes. We were the first in the world to solve this structure. And we used this structure as a three-dimensional guide to build a drug called Nacina, shown here. Tens of millions of people take this drug every day for type 2 diabetes. So I mentioned, okay, okay, thanks. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, some of these projects leave scars. And my scar with Cyrix came in the form of broken trust with my grandmother. She was a beautiful woman, she was brilliant, and she was the first person in the world to believe I could do stuff like this. She put the first $25,000 into the company. I had this uncle. He supported himself exclusively by chasing ambulances and filing lawsuits. And he heard I got venture capital. And he's, he'd never seen that before, his eyes got all twinkly. And he went to my grandmother and said, ooh, you gotta lean on him, you gotta squeeze this guy. My grandmother was elderly and quite influenceable, and things got ugly. What my uncle really wanted 
was for me to pay him. So I gave him some stock. He went away. To this day, I have not laid eyes on him again. But what I got was broken trust with my grandmother at the end of her life. I can't get that back, and I carry the scar to this day. But I persevere. I do other projects, like this one, a few years later. I found it with a bunch of friends of mine and I. Sapphire Energy. The idea is quite simple. This is Moscow at rush hour. Isn't that what's amazing? I think this photograph really captures humanity's dependence on fossil fuel. Now, the political costs and environmental costs of this dependence are widely known. So we thought, would there be some way we could harness algae's natural proclivity to make oil, but combine that with modern genome engineering techniques to produce a green, sustainable fuel? Well, our model for this was Teosinte, the great-great-grandfather of modern corn. Here in show is this weed, but after 7,000 years of selective breeding, you have this wonderful monstrosity you get at Safeway. For algae, we didn't want to do it in 7,000 years. We wanted to do it in five. So we recruited 70 molecular biologists that joined us in San Diego. We built this facility in the desert in New Mexico. It's a mile long, and so you can see it from space, which, by the way, is incredibly cool. <laughs> and um, we always wanted to build something you can see from space. We, uh, we used this facility to produce a whole bunch of algal biomass. We extracted the oils from that, which we refined into fuels. We drove a car across the country. We flew a 737. And then after the longest sustained high oil prices in human history, this happened. <laughs> oil went from 100 to 50. Now, for some businesses, that's good. Not so for ours. We figured at scale we could make barrels of oil for about $75. The problem is we had to tolerate price shocks down to 50. And there's no climate policy that could protect us from this, at least not today. So we laid off about half the people, and the company's now producing food additives using the same technology. This too left a scar. When my friends and I founded this company, we literally looked into each other's eyes and thought, among other things, okay, <laughs> we're gonna change the world. I mean, this, this, can, this can make the world better. And we were naive. There were forces much bigger than we were at work, and they dashed that dream, at least for now. So I'm going to tell you guys about a brand new project. It's in stealth mode, so you won't find it anywhere on the web. And it asks a deceptively simple question. It's this. How come when we get older, we get sicker? Well, we are not arrogant enough to claim we know all the reasons why. But we think we know one. And it's this. This is you at conception. You're a single cell. You divide. In fact, you divide a bunch of times. Ultimately, about 50 times for most cell types in your body, at which point these cells stop dividing forever. Cells that do this are said to be senescent cells, and this system is a very important anti-cancer system. The issue is that as you age, these cells accumulate in you. So my son here, who's six and is floating around somewhere back there, there he is, okay, he has no detectable senescent cells in him. Whereas my stepfather, at the time of his death at 87, was full of these cells. Now, before our work, no one knew if these cells were good for you, bad for you, or neither. So my group, in collaboration with groups at the Mayo Clinic and Buck Institute, created mice where we could clear these cells whenever we wanted. And we got to ask, for the first time, what happens? Well, this is what happens. These mice are siblings. They're born within seconds of each other. They're also genetically identical. And to give you a sense of their age, these mice are about 70 years old, if they were a person, or if you were a mouse, okay? okay. This one on the left is blind, osteoporotic, and frail. This one on the right has none of those problems and lives longer. We're making drugs that do that. That is cool. <laughs> So, when I'm interviewing scientists to join these projects, I ask them a single important question. I ask them, what do you think is cool? What ideas do you find so beautiful that they'll allow you to endure all the failures, all the scars you're going to accumulate? Well, Carl Sagan suggests that we as humans invest faraway places, perhaps even far out ideas, with a kind of romance, and that this appeal was actually crafted by natural selection as an essential element of our survival. It's 
hard to speculate on evolution for those of us that were not around to watch it. But <laughs> that sure would explain a lot. Thank you very much.